Good morning, Faith. I know I've greeted you before, but I like to greet you. So, this morning, if you would turn with me to John 1:14, we've been here before. But this verse is going to be our text for this morning, John 1:14. So, as we have done in other weeks, uh, after I read the verse, I'm going to say the word of the Lord, and then if you would join me in saying, thanks be to God. So, John 1.14, let's read God's word here this morning. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food that we read this morning that we have read, that it might nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven, amen. So imagine that for a moment that Steph Curry, the basketball player from the Golden State Warriors, imagine that Steph decides to move into your neighborhood, right? Let's say he doesn't just decide to move into your neighborhood, but every day he practices in his driveway out front, right? Now, I would, if you're like me, at that moment, you're like, okay, it's time to take a little stroll. Kids, you want to go for a walk, right? Like, we're going to go see Steph Curry play basketball. You know, I imagine in that scenario, right, like his neighbors are, char- are start charging, like, hey, you want a picnic spot? You know, it's like $100 here, $50 a little further back. Uh, but Steph Curry, you know, that would be unbelievable for him, you know, to move into our neighborhood. Now, imagine, though, that like you're out walking and, you know, you've seen him play, right? But you're out walking your dog, he's out walking his dog, right? And you guys like bump into each other, you meet. And he's like, oh, you know, you're like, you know, you try not to be starstruck. So you're like, yeah, man, what's up? Like, you know, I'm a ball player too. Um, And so you talk with him and he's like, you know what? Why don't you come by the house? Let's practice together. That would be like unbelievable, right? Not only are you getting to watch Steph Curry, but now you're getting to play with Steph Curry, right? And you try to guard him, right? Like try, but it's not happening. Um, You know, your games are like he scores 100 and you score like negative, right? Um, But Steph, right? That would just be an unbelievable scenario. You're getting to kind of witness firsthand what we would say like is his basketball glory. So this is, of course, is a fictional story, right? Like Steph Curry more than likely lives in a gated community, right? Like he's probably in a secluded million dollar home with other millionaires um, who surround him. So, you know, we find like this story to be unbelievable and silly, right? Because someone like of that status would never probably live in our neighborhoods, right? Um, that most of us occupy. So he would ne- certainly never live in the neighborhood wherever Sarah and I are going to buy our home, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and probably for most of us here, right, you know, he wouldn't, you know, we find it unbelievable and silly. He would never live in our neighborhoods. But I was thinking about this. This is the surprise of the gospel, right? The gospel is God's news to us. 
And within that, good news, there's a surprise for us. Now, how many of you guys like a surprise, right? People like surprises, generally speaking. Um, we like to be surprised, but we don't like to be surprised. You know, it can be difficult, right? Um, but here's the surprise. Here's the surprise of the gospel. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the surprise of the gospel. Or another way that has been put is that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Or the Net Bible puts it this way. Now the word became flesh and took up residence among us. I like that, took up residence among us. Eugene Peterson in the message, he puts it this way. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. (laughs) He moved into the neighborhood, right? So that's shocking. That should be a surprise to us, right? Our rich and famous God chose to move into our neighborhood. He pitched his tent among us, right? Like these uh, people who are very rich and famous, they aren't living in most of our neighborhoods. They wouldn't choose to. Yet our rich God, our famous God, the God of the universe, the God of all glory chose to move into our neighborhood, to live with us. So right now, right, there's lots of people looking to buy a home. Um, In fact, Sarah and I are one of them, right? We're out there. I mean, I think we hit the streets like, you know, a couple times a week. You know, we're coming close to becoming like the Jehovah's Witnesses of buying houses. (laughs) You know, like we're knocking on doors aggressively, right? Um, Like we will throw in a car wash for you. Like what will it take to sign this deal, right? Uh, we're drawn to desirable neighborhoods, or should we really say desirable neighbors? We discriminate, right? We only want to pitch our tent in nice neighborhoods, among nice neighbors. So what was God's housing criteria, right? When God looked down on our neighborhood, what did he see? Probably... What most of us would say when we drive into, you know, West Philly, right? He saw violence. He saw addiction, spiritual poverty, abuse, and more. Yet, he moved into the neighborhood and dwelt among us. So what does this mean for us, right? how we relate to others, and how we share the gospel and make disciples and build friendships that benefit and do good to others. Have, have we, right, or to make it more personal, like have you created relational zoning laws only dwelling with those people you like or those kinds of people that benefit you or make you feel safe and comfortable. So we, the church, right, we have to abolish together and individually. We have to seek to abolish these relational zoning laws. We must, if we are to fulfill the Great Commission, to obey Jesus' command to go and make disciples of all nations or ethnic groups, we have to, like our Messiah, be active in cultivating relationships with and caring for all people regardless of status, regardless of race, right? Regardless of socioeconomic, you know, status where they're at. We read that the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. That word dwelt there is really key it's a, it's a Greek word, and we've talked about this a few weeks ago. It's a Greek word that means tent or tabernacle. So the verse can actually read like this. And the word became flesh and pitched his tent or tabernacled 
among us. So why is that important, right? Why bring that up? What is God revealing about Jesus here by calling him a tent or a tab- like that he tented with us or tabernacled with us? Uh, what, you know, what we, what we find, what we read here is that Jesus is the tabernacle. He's the tent of meeting, right? So what's, what's meant by that, like the tabernacle and the tent of meeting? You know, not everybody, right? Like 50 years ago, probably a lot of people were familiar with the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, right? A lot of people, though, now today, what's the tabernacle? What's the tent of meeting, right? What's that about? So if we're to understand what John's saying here, we, kinda, we have to go back. So in the New Testament, when, when John's writing this, he doesn't have the New Testament, right? All they have is the Old Testament. That's what they're working off of. So let's go back to the Old Testament, find out what this means. So in Exodus 25, 8, Exodus 25, 8, God commands the people of Israel to build a tabernacle. And that's what he says. He says, and let them, meaning the the people of Israel, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. So that I may dwell in their midst. All the people of Israel, what, what would happen is, They would be like in their tents, and then in the center of those tents is God in his tent. He pitches his tent right in the middle, his tabernacle right in the middle, and then all around him are the people of Israel. He's dwelling actually physically right in their midst, right? So he would be at the center of, of their life, of their community. So the dominant theme or the great narrative thread of Scripture is this, right? So if you were to go from like Genesis to Revelation, what's the dominant theme? What's the, what's the narrative that you just, that threads throughout the whole thing, right? Here it is. I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. That's the dominant thread, right? So from the very beginning, consider this with me, all right? I'm going to like go on a little, little bit of a, like a theological bent, right? But I want you guys to hang with me because I'm going to make some connections that I want you guys to see here, right? That God's heartbeat from the beginning is I will be their God and they're going to be my people and I'm going to live with them and I'm going to be among them and walk with them. So from the very beginning, right, God walked with us where? In the garden, right? He walked with Adam and Eve, it talks about, in the garden. He dwelled with us. So there are strong connections between the garden and the tabernacle. So God dwells there and meets with man. So the garden had a tree of life, right? And a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, The tabernacle had a lampstand that was fashioned to resemble a tree. The garden had precious gems and stones in it, right? The tabernacle was built with precious gems and stones. God dwelled in the garden, and he dwelled in the tabernacle. But man didn't continue to dwell with God and love him. So instead, we sinned. That is, we rejected or ignored God in the world that he created. We rebelled against him by living without reference to him, by not being or doing what he requires in his law. So what's the result of sin, right? Adam and Eve, they were kicked out of the garden. They were banished. And two cherubim, two angelic creatures, beings, were placed at the entrance to the garden, right? Guarding the way into the garden and visually barricading their entrance back into the garden, right? So likewise, for the people of Israel, in the tabernacle, there were two cherubim and a curtain 
that blocked entrance into the direct presence of God. So you see the connections here, right? So how do we get back into the presence of God so that we might walk with God as, you know, we walk with a friend? How do we get back to, I will be their God and they'll be my people? So we might think that the solution is ours since the problem is ours, right? But the truth is, is that we can do little to bring about this state of intimacy, right? Where God dwells among us and we're his people and he's our God. So there's little that we can do. At first it seems like, hey, this is like, we need to do something here, but, but it's because we have the problem. So we often think, well, if I have a problem, right? The answer to the, to the problem is me, I'm the solution. But here we find like we're not the solution to the problem. So the only one who can provide a solution is God himself. So I want you to think about with me, like go back to Adam and Eve. God came to them after they sinned, right? And sought them out. What did they do? They, they tried to like go and hide from God. So they were naked, it says. Now, when you, when you hear that like phrase naked, it's not just physically speaking. When you're naked, right, like you're exposed, so to speak. Adam and Eve were exposed in their sin. They felt shame and guilt. So how did God, how did God clothe their shame and guilt? By sacrificing an animal, by shedding blood. And, and the text says that God clothed them with animal skins. So in order for God, God wasn't creating like fake animal skins here. He, he didn't like set up a, fa- a factory, you know, he had to kill an animal to clothe them. So this is rich imagery. How did God make provision for sin and cover guilt and shame for the people of God in the Old Testament? Sacrifice at the temple. An animal was slaughtered. Blood was sprinkled on the people, and it was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant to cover sin, to cover the people's guilt. So in fact, in the tabernacle where God dwelt among his people, the first thing the people of Israel saw upon entering the tabernacle was an altar of sacrifice. So the only way to meet with God was through sacrifice. So this brings us back to our verse, right? Jesus, when John, is, when John says that Jesus is the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, he's drawing from this rich history. It has like context to it. So you might say, right, that you might be thinking, well, does Jesus at all say himself that he's a temple or tabernacle. And I'm glad you asked, right? Because John chapter 2, verses 19 to 21 says this. Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews are thinking he's talking about the physical temple. And so they say to him, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days, right? They were confused by this. And I think probably we would be too. Like, man, Jesus is the greatest builder ever, right? Like it took us 46 years. And I, I know that there's some people who are waiting for their homes to be built and it feels like 46 years, right? But, but Jesus here wasn't speaking about the physical temple, He was speaking about the temple of his body, it says. So Jesus replaced the temple. Everything like about the temple or the tabernacle pointed to Jesus. Like what, who he was, what he would do. So often in the Old Testament, the tabernacle was called uh, the tent of meeting. That's another word for it. So why is it called like the tent of meeting? 
It's because, it's like pretty self-explanatory, but because that was where like the people of God met with God. That's why it was called the tent of meeting. And so it's only through the tent of meeting, which is now Jesus, that we meet with God. So like if the people of God wanted to to come and, and to pray to God, they wanted to fellowship with God, they wanted to worship God, they had to go to the tabernacle. They actually had to physically, physically walk into the tent of meeting, right? And like if we want to meet with God, if we want to worship him, if we want to have fellowship with him, we have to be in Jesus, in the tent of meeting, which is Jesus. Like the animals, right? Jesus is the lamb of God, sacrificed for us, and he covers our sin and shame. And like the sacrifices in the tabernacle, only by his blood are sins covered and forgiven. Now, I want you to remember when Jesus died, right? The curtain in the temple, what happened to it? We read that it was torn in two from top to bottom. Visually displaying what? That God had provided a way for us to re-enter the garden. God provided a way. He took away the cherubim. He took away what blocked our entrance. And now he's like, you guys can come back in. I made a way for you to come back in, for us to walk together in the garden again to go into the innermost chamber of the tabernacle and meet with God once more. So very vividly, vividly, God was keeping his promise to dwell among us. From the very beginning, that was always God's intention. I'm going to live with you guys, and you're going to see me face to face. And God's keeping that promise. So the first point for today is this, believe right? Believe what? All that we just talked about, everything that we just talked about. Believe that Jesus is our tabernacle, our tent of meeting, that it's only through him and by him and in him that we meet with God. Believe in the incarnation and that God, Jesus, took on flesh and that he tabernacled or pitched his tent on us. Believe that it's only through his sacrifice that our sin and shame can be covered and forgiven. Believe those things, right? So believe. So the next question is this, why did the Son of God tabernacle among us? Why, why would he do that? It's, we read it in verse 14 of John 1, if you wanna look back there. It, it's so that we might behold, right? Believe and behold. John 1.14 says this, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen or beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So in the Old Testament, God's glory, it like filled the tabernacle. We talk, we talk as a church, we talk an awful lot about glory. But what exactly is glory, Right? So theologian, theologian Christopher Morgan says this. He says, the glory of God is this. It's the magnific magnificence, the worth, the loveliness, and the grandeur of his many perfections, which he displays in his creative and redemptive acts in order to make his glory known to those in his presence. So let me read, let me read that one more time. The glory of God is the magnificence, worth, loveliness, and grandeur of his many perfections, which he displays in his creative and redemptive acts in order to make his glory known to those in his presence. So at and in the tabernacle, God did this, right? And, and Jesus God does this. So we need to, what I want to encourage us to do is not only believe, but to behold the glory of God in Jesus. So while Jesus tabernacled among us, the disciples beheld his glory. So today, how do we behold, like if we're not the disciples and Jesus isn't physically right here 
And we're not going down to the Acme to go grocery shopping with Jesus and see him work his magic. You know what I mean? Like we get up to the register. That would be great, right? You get up to the register and they're like, that'd be $300. And Jesus is like, bubbling. And it goes down to like five cents. And he's like, thank you. And you're like, that's awesome. I believe. Um, But what do we do? We're not actually with Jesus. So how do we see his glory? Well, we see it by reading. (laughs) Most of you guys are like, I hate reading, right? Reading is like awful. I like, I like to read. So like when I meet people who don't like to read, I'm like, ah, that's one thing we don't have in common. Um, And so, you know, my kids like me to read uh, to them and they find it enjoying. So like, if you don't like to read and you're like, hey, I just want to pop by the office and Paul can read some scripture to me. Come to the office. (laughs) I'll have milk and cookies. You can sit down. I'll read some scripture to you and we'll chill, right? Or you can also listen to it, right? So you can listen to it. They've made a way for you to be able to listen to scripture as well now. But the way that we behold the glory is by reading the gospel of Matthew, by reading the gospel of Luke and John and Mark, right? We see Jesus as we read, as we listen. So by reading the New Testament and all the ways that the Old Testament points to and finds fulfillment in Jesus. So to, to behold, right, is not to stare absentmindedly, nor merely just to look quickly, nor necessarily just to perceive comprehensively. On the contrary, we are regarding an object and reflecting upon it. We're scanning it, examining it with care, and studying it, and viewing it, and considering it thoughtfully, right? I remember some of you guys, anybody... Um, has been down to the Outer Banks. Yeah, we got some Outer Banks people. I love the Outer Banks, right? They have a great aquarium in, in the Outer Banks. And I remember we took, our, we took our kids there, and <laughs> I remember when we saw the jellyfish tanks. Now, this is probably a, like original to the North Carolina aquarium, but, you know, they, they put the jellyfish in these, like, round pillar that you can, you can see through, you know, these glass and it has bubbles in it and they change the colors of the water, you know, and you see the jellyfish like just floating. And I remember seeing my kids like just flat faced against that, right? Like just looking at it, you know, and you're like, Ugh, you know, back away. Um, but they're just, they're just amazed by it. You know, they're just looking up and just watching the jellyfish in amazement and wonder. They're, they're not just like, you know, really quick glancing at it. They're like really looking at it, examining it, watching every part of it. And the effect of it is that they're amazed. It like leaves them in wonder. And so the more that we spend time with Jesus, the more that we read about him, the more that we just take him in and we just, we're like that kid who's flat-faced, you know, like, eh, you know, just on the glass, you know, and just looking up and we just see Jesus, all the details, and it just produces wonder and amazement in us. Like, we're beholding the glory of God, right? We're just, Wow, this is blowing me away. And it changes your life. It changes how you live. Evangelism isn't born out of guilt. It's born out of wonder and amazement. Like, if you want to be a great evangelist, don't guilt trip yourself. Spend time with Jesus. Get amazed by him, right? Let him leave you in a state where you're just like, wow, the majesty Like, I got to tell other people about this, right? So I just joined Kinetics, right? The gym. Stan was telling me about it. Some of you guys, you're like, Stan and I are different people, right? You mind if I share this, Stan? (laughs) Stan's a people person. When he goes to the gym, he likes to hang out with people. When I go to the gym, I don't want to see anybody, you know? I don't want anybody to come up to me and be like, hey, bro, how much longer do you have on that equipment, you know? Uh, I like to go, and it's like, 
dead, right? And I love, because of that, right, I, I, I briefly checked out Planet Fitness in this, like, shopping mall, and there was, I don't know, like, 3,000 people there. <laughs> and, you know, everybody's, you know, you can't find any equipment. And I was like, no, oh, I'm canceling, right? But I love kinetics. It's, it's like rugged. I feel like, I feel like Rocky after he's been beaten by the Russian and he has to go do some training, right? And it's like in the rugged place, in the dirty place, like in the, in the place that's not like 10 out of 10, right? That's what I love, right? And I look a bit like Rocky after he's been beat up by the Russian. The Russian is life and I'm Rocky, right? So I'm trying to train myself, get myself back together. So, but I love kinetics and guess what? Because I go to kinetics and I love it and I spend time there, I tell people about it. I'm like, bro, you got to join kinetics. This is, but it's also kind of a catch 22 because I don't want a lot of people there. (laughs) But you're like, once I find something, you know, Sarah tells me I'm a great salesman because like, I just tell people about it. If I find it and I love it, you're going to hear about it. Right. It's like with Jesus, it's like, you can't guilt trip it. Right. It's just a burden. You got to be like, man, I love Jesus. He's changing my life, spending time with him. I'm amazed. And you're like, I'm going to go tell other people about this. But you got to spend time with him. You can't hear about it from other people. You know, you got you to do it yourself, right? So, wow, that was a little bit of a rabbit trail. <laughs> so believe, behold, Final point real quick is broadcast. So the Apostle John is, he's a broadcaster. So he made widely known to us now, because like he wrote it down and it was preserved for us, but he also shared with other people. He made known this, this is what he broadcasted. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us and we have seen or beheld his glory, glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth. So likewise, we are God's people to broadcast or make widely known Christ and all who he is, right? By word, yes, definitely by word. Right? You can't just be like, you know, I hope that people see the good works I do and they like turn to Christ because I'm living a really good life. More than likely, what people are going to think about you is just that you're a really good person, right? So, like, you verbally have to tell other people about the gospel. Like, that's how I heard. I'm sure that's probably a lot of how, how all of us in this room probably heard in some way or another, right? Like, somebody put a Gideon Bible, right? Like, we all came to faith because somebody else stepped out in faith, right? So, so likewise, right? We got to broadcast it. So Jesus was the tabernacle on earth, but he was on earth, but then he ascended to heaven where he now lives at the right hand uh, of the Father, right? And, and what's he doing like at the Father's right hand? This is a beautiful truth. He's praying for you. Like as a believer, you don't just have other people in this room praying for you. You have Jesus praying for you daily. That's awesome. So, but where's the tabernacle now? Is there a tabernacle? Where does God now reside? And this is the crazy answer. (laughs) The answer is in us. God's people, the church. The apostle Paul says this, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. And later he writes this, he says this, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we, and he's talking about the church, we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and will walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Church, we are God's temple. We're the tabernacle, individually and collectively. We're the we're the tent of meeting now, right? So who's the high priest? It's Jesus, right? And we are called 
a kingdom of priests. So what do priests do? (laughs) Right? You're like, you you probably have lots of ideas about what priests do, uh, culturally speaking. In essence, they serve God and others. They mediate on the behalf of other people. So as individuals and a church, we need to act as priests. Like, I'm not just a priest because I'm a pastor, but like, if you're a Christian here this morning, you are a priest. You are a minister. You have to like, get that, see that as yourself. Like, you're not just mom or dad. You're not just father, son. You're not just, you know, wife, daughter. You're not just an employee at wherever, like, you are a priest of God. So we are helping others to be reconciled to God and other people, to minister grace to them, to pray for them, to apply the gospel to what is happening in their lives, to help them make sense of it. So while building the tabernacle, God's spirit, right? He, God's spirit empowered and enabled craftsmen to build up the tabernacle stone by stone. So too, God's spirit empowers and enables us to be skilled craftsmen. To build up the building of God, the people, the stones of God, right? Not to tear down, but to build up. So think about a physical building, like God's, in the Old Testament, God was like, all right, you guys need people who who know how to follow instructions and make this building, right? You need supervisors, you need people who can, who can, who can work with metal and work with gems, and God's spirit enabled people to be able to do that and to build up the tabernacle. Now we're the people of God, and you all have gifts. God has given you a gift, more than one probably. And you have to use that gift to build up God's people, the temple. Not tear it down, but to build it up. So as we, the church, local and universal, this is crazy. As we go and make disciples of all people groups, right? God's spirit dwells in them. And guess what happens to the tabernacle? It expands. Now... It's no longer a tabernacle located only in the wilderness or in Jerusalem. Now the four posts of the tabernacle are the four corners of the world. The tent or the canopy stretches globally. Right now the tent of meeting can be found everywhere in the people of God by the Spirit. So people... People come to know and meet with God through us. We're the tent of meeting. But it's been a rough go at that as the church. Many people find it hard to see or know Jesus in the church. And why is that? I think there's a whole host of reasons. But quickly, just one reason I think is because we're not serious about holiness. And I don't mean that in some like legalistic, rule-oriented living, right? I'm talking about listening to Jesus, obeying Jesus, and following Jesus. So in the Gospels, it's recorded that Jesus came upon the temple one day and found it, instead of a place of worship, he found it a place of business, Like greedy businessmen and women were running money schemes for a profit. And guess what Jesus did, right? He fashioned a whip, he flipped some tables, and he drove people out. So, okay, don't carry that too far. I'm not encouraging anybody here to whip anybody else, right? I'm encouraging us to drive out our own idols, right? You got to fashion a whip and drive out your own idols. So don't substitute 
I'm going to get a little bit edgy, forgive me. Don't substitute the love of Jesus for the love of a candidate, right? I want to encourage you, listen, listen to our culture, right? They are saying that we're really hardcore about what we believe, but that we're really light when it comes to the care for the needs of others, particularly those of minority and those who have been abused. We play church politics when we need to be focused on Christ and his mission. We can make things more about us and what we want and how we want it, and it's seen in how we treat others and our attitude when things don't go our way or how we want it to be. What I want us to do is let's make God our focus, right? His desires first. So faith, we're a tabernacle, a temple, a tent of meeting of God. The place where people encounter the living God should be here, should be with us. So let's be a pure tabernacle, a beautiful, life-giving place filled with love for God and love for others, governed by the truth of God's word. Let our, let our neighbors meet God here, right? Build up one another, the temple. Use your spirit-given gifts to do that. So believe, behold, and broadcast. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, I take it to heart for myself. Help me not just to be a person of words, but God, I pray that my actions and how I live would align with what I say. Help me not to be just a doer, or just a hearer, but also a doer, Father. Help me to love. Help me to be a priest, to think of myself in that way. Help me to care for those around me. Help me to abolish relational zoning laws. God, help me to be in wonder and amazement of Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.